Please welcome Shai Agassi, uh, the founder and CEO of A Better Place. All right. Thank you. Where do you want me? All right, yeah, good question. They didn't tell me that, so I'll sit here and you sit All there right. that, and, hope, and we hope they can adapt. Oh, my God. <laughs> you sink and you never So, you know, I wanted to start with a bit of a discussion of business model. You know, what we've seen, you know, from the history of the web is that the biggest challenge to any existing, you know, industry, it doesn't come from a new product or a new product category, but from a new business model. I mean, a great example in our industry, you know, Microsoft ate Netscape for lunch, uh, but Google is giving them indigestion, you know, and you guys are doing something which at its heart has a very, very different business model for the auto industry. So maybe you could start by just unpacking that for us and tell us how it works. All right. So um, I actually look at it and, and there's a story about uh, every, every disruption is a combination of technology shift plus a new business model. Mm -hmm. So Google, Google to a certain degree is Excite with the business model. Excite didn't have a business model. Yeah. Um, we looked at the electric car and said, uh, what needs to happen in order to make electric cars the sort of the de facto standard um, is the following three elements. One, um, you need um, a battery plus electricity that will be cheaper than gasoline. Um, and we actually have that. So the technology disruptions already happened, it actually happened about seven, eight years ago. And yet nobody understood that, just like when Excite came out, nobody understood that what it really meant is fundamental shift on, on media, on, on advertising. Um, the price of a battery plus electricity per mile today is about six cents. And so, you know, even if you take the average uh, cafe standard, you know, sort of 20, 25 miles per gallon, you're looking at a buck 50 a gallon equivalency. So yep. we're, we're significantly cheaper. So even, you know, a hybrid, you're getting up there to three bucks a gallon equivalent. Yeah, so, so. so we're, we're looking at a disruption that has already happened technology-wise. now. The business model part is, um, was the problem that cars and car makers were looking at the battery as part of the car. And so they were trying to sell you a car plus the battery. But the battery is a consumable. It's like, an, it's like selling you a, uh, a laser jet, a printer. With, with all the paper you'd ever need. With all the ink jet <laughs> yeah, yeah. you'd ever need. Yeah. And so they, they tried to sort of pre-bundle mm -hmm. the, 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 the printer and the, and the yeah. ink. And that, it, and that price became so high that it, it always looked like um, a too expensive product to buy. And at the same time, they did a, a perfect Osborne II on the industry because you always hear about the next battery that will be there seven years from now. Yeah. You know, the, the, the magic yeah, yeah, battery yeah, that sure, will yeah, go 400 yeah. miles, for, you yeah, know, yeah. Three, three minutes charge. And nobody wants to buy a car with the old battery. Right. And so all these disruptions were always, uh, were always around the corner. Right. But what we said is just buy the car without the battery. Charge everywhere you want. So charge home, charge at work, charge wherever it is. Don't pay for the charge. And if you want to go beyond the distance of the battery you got in your car, switch the battery. Because the battery is not yours. Okay. And we'll put the network before we put in the devices. Okay. And the entire model is the mobile phone model. Okay. So how did you actually get to that model? I mean... <laughs> I was, I was working um, the exact opposite model, so I was trying to convince people that if you buy an electric car for about $15,000 more than a gasoline car, over time, there's a great return on investment. So there's a TCO would reduce in year six, seven, eight, and it would be cheap. And one day I was in a conference and I was presenting that model um, to President Clinton. We were sitting about this distance and yeah. I was sort of talking to him for about five minutes, telling him how I'm gonna do this in Israel and then we'll bring it to the US once we've proven it in Israel. And he was the first guy who told me, um, you're solving the right problem at the wrong time frame. Hmm. He says, you need to figure out a way to get average Joe into your car. And average Joe doesn't even go to the dealership. He buys a used car, eight years old car, and wastes it. And when, when average Joe wasted the car, he goes out and buys another used car. And so you have to figure out how to put average Joe into your car for free so that he, do, he does the right thing. Hmm. And I said, well, how do you do that? How do you give somebody a free car and still make money? He looked at me with absolute seriousness and said, I don't know, you're the smart guy. Turn around, walked away. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I sort of scratched my head. And, and then I realized, you know, we're all walking around with, with, with that device, right? Yeah. We all got a phone. It's getting to be more and more and more smart. We're paying less and less for the well, device. We're, we're, except there's a little bit going the other way. I mean, we're starting to pay more for the device. If as, it's as, really yeah. sexy, yeah. right? So, so if you think about it, we, paid, yeah. we would pay for the Tesla. Yeah like an iPhone. 
Yeah. But the average electric car, we'd get you know, free or close to free yeah. if we're willing to pay for the miles. So how, how, how low do you think the cars that you might offer will be? In the end? It, it depends on the location. It depends on the amount of miles you drive. And it depends on the car that you, you drive. So the, if you're in Europe, where you're paying 8 $9 a gallon, yeah. and you're in the brackets sort of the 25th percentile up, that you're driving you know, 20, 25,000 miles a year and more, you should get a car for free. Okay. All right? If, well, what, what if you just charge it at home? You never make any money then, right? Yeah, but that, that's a different consumer in a sense. So yeah. that's the consumer who used to talk on, uh, on their hand phone yeah. and now is talking on the wireless phone at home, but okay. it's not a cell phone. Okay, so that guy doesn't need to pay for the network. They've yeah. got it at home. But if you want to go infinite, which is what you have your, your car, your car doesn't have a range of what your gas tank is. You don't finish the gas in your gas tank and start walking home. Your extent, Sometimes you do. <laughs> yeah, if, if, if you're Kramer on Seinfeld. But if, if, you're, you know, if, if you're in a car, the extent, the yeah, reach yeah, of your sure. car, the autonomy of your car yeah. is the reach of the network. The, 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 so you're actually placing almost the opposite bet than Elon in that he's, he's saying that the key consumer drives you know, that his 250 mile an hour, 250 mile range is plenty. People will charge at home. Um, and you're saying, no, we're actually really going to work with the other, the high intensity consumer who's got to go long distances. Yeah, I, I started from a very different problem definition than Elon. Yeah. My problem definition said, how do you take a country off oil? Mm -hmm. And Elon started from, how do you build the best experience on an electric motor? Mm -hmm. And we're starting with a problem that requires 700 million cars, and Elon started with a company that requires 7,000 cars. So, but 700 million cars, huge, huge problem, huge investment. Mm -hmm. Who's going to make that investment? I mean, that's the, the beauty of the approach, and that's what we picked up from the web, is you could go and build a fully integrated end-to-end -end solution. Yeah. All right? So, um, you, you could build, build Minitel, and Minitel works. Yeah. But well, you were, worked. So it worked. It, it was fantastic, yeah. Yeah. right? It, you, you know, I, yeah, yeah. It was a mini web. Yeah. Um, but the best way to get it done is to build an open platform for everybody to come on board. Yeah. And so we've defined where the interface points are. We've defined where the identity is. We've defined where energy is. We've defined how to exchange energy. Sort of like gas stations. If you think yeah. of gas stations, they have two interfaces. The, the nozzle is the same size, and the chemistry is the same chemistry. Yeah. But from that point on, everybody can build whatever car they want, whatever gas station they want, and everybody can go on at it. And yeah, so, so, so kind of coming back to this... Um, basic idea, which I realize everybody, may, we, we haven't necessarily got to that level of detail. The idea is you can charge your car at home, but you're on long distance, you pull into the equivalent of a gas station and they swap out your batteries. Right, so you come into a device that looks sort of like a, a, a car wash, only it doesn't wash your car. It puts a plate onto your battery, your depleted battery comes out, a full battery comes in and you keep driving. Yeah. And the whole thing, we've now got a cycle to less time than it takes you to fill up with gasoline. Say so you swipe your credit card or whatever. No, you don't. Yeah. You, you don't pay for a... Oh, because you're a subscriber. You pay for miles. Uh, okay, so, so you don't pay for electricity. As a matter of fact, if you charge at home, we pay you back the electricity. Oh, okay. Okay? You don't charge, we don't charge you for swap. If you, if you swap too many times, we pay you money because it's inconvenience. Hmm. Okay? We pay, you pay for miles because what you really bought is infinite driving. Hmm. You, you bought the convenience of driving. And so... We guarantee you that if you swapped, if you ended up needing to swap more than 50 times a year, once a week, that's an inconvenience. We need to pay you, not the other way around. Hmm. So uh, you're going to have to kind of, do you demonstrate the math anywhere that you're actually going to make money at this? <laughs> Let me put it this way. At, at, uh, when you drove around and the price of gasoline was an arm and a leg. Yeah. All right. We basically said, if you're willing to pay, you know, think of Europe. If you're willing to pay eight dollars a gallon, nine dollars yeah, a gallon, yeah. which is still there, where it's sort yeah. of seven and a half, eight dollars across Europe, somebody mm -hmm. should give you the car for free. Yeah. All right. If, 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 you, if you, you think about it, well, the average the average car in Europe today is not a uh, sort of a VW Golf. The, it's right. it's a VW Polo circa 1999. Right. And that's so, the so, so, car in the so basically, the the auto companies go, okay, yeah, we can be indifferent to this model. It could even be a new, great new model for us. Uh, the oil companies are going to hate you, right? No. So, no, how, why, what, what do they get out of this? Because right now, <laughs> you you, they, you they, talk you, to an oil. I mean, if you looked at the at the sort of the the annual reports of oil companies, the big oil companies today, the Chevrons, the 
the, yeah. the beyond petroleums, the shells of the world, they're not allowed to dig anymore. Right, and they, and they know that peak oil is, is upon us even if they're not letting on. It's not even peak oil, it's <laughs> no. their own mini peak, peak oil. They're not allowed to dig, hence their reservoirs, which used to yeah, be 80% yeah. of the world's known oil, today is about 20%. Yeah. So they know it's gonna last until 2017, 18, 19. And can you imagine, annual report 2018, Chevron comes up and says, it's been a fantastic run. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. That's it, we ran out. Now, yeah, yeah. all these guys are looking, there's a reason why BP is called Beyond Petroleum. They're looking for what yeah, comes yeah. beyond petroleum. Yeah. And we're going back to the essence of their business. Their, yeah. their essence is we give you energy to drive a car. We're selling you miles. Right. Is your point. Yeah, okay. So what about, uh, you're partnering with Renault and Nissan to actually build vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, they coming through? Well, they, they got nine uh, models yeah. between them, um, and I can say that because they, they said it publicly. They'll come between 2010 and 2014, so they've got, they're all slated yeah. sort of year after year. They've shown a couple of the models already. They're very, very nice, very sexy. Um, the cars are fast. That, I mean, that's the first question we get asked. Yeah. They're faster than their um, gasoline counterparts yeah. at, at what you really want to measure, which is passing speed by a factor of two. Yeah, I know. I've ridden in Ian Wright's car, so I know that, how fast an electric can be. <laughs> so that, that's the first thing. The second thing is they put about a billion dollars to play. Yeah. And that's the beauty of platforms. We build the platform, but the guys who build the applications, the cars, you know, yeah. they can put a, a, a ton of money to play. So uh, uh, is the economic downturn, you think, going to affect any of these guys? I mean, in their commitment? Um, you know, there, I, I heard a great, a great story today. The, uh, there are two signs erected in, uh, in the Midwest. One says, in Chicago, one says, got change. And the one in Detroit today says, got change. <laughs> um, it, it, you, you sort of got to a point where you, you got to worry about this industry. I actually think that, that uh, if you look at where we are vis-a-vis -vis the, the auto industry, it's not just about who gets through this downturn because we're, we're going to end up 12 months from now about half as many car companies because yeah. of sure. what will happen. The question is who comes up with a new business model right. that saves the car industry. And the car industry today is absolutely in a razor um, business. Yeah. Okay, they sell you the car and your next interaction is usually negative interaction with them. They have to be in the blades industry. All right? Yeah. And, and if Ford today got a, a penny for every mile driven on a Ford car, Ford would get a $10, a $10 billion check at the beginning of every year. Yeah. Not from the government, but from its worldwide consumers. But, but they would at that point be taking pennies that have been given to the oil industry so far? They haven't given it, they just haven't thought about it. Yeah. Everybody around them has been in the blades business. No, I understand, but the oil companies are selling some of the blades, and if the car companies start try, trying to sell the blades instead, then they become competitors. Right, the problem with oil is yeah. you don't know where to pick up the penny, Yeah. right? It, is it from the yeah. guy who digs it out of the ground, yeah, the guy yeah. who puts it at the, at the refinery, the guy who puts it into the gas station? So, so you're really talking about a massive change, and uh, you know, do we have, you know, and obviously markets can force change on people who don't otherwise want it. Um, you know, on the other hand, it's, it's often an uphill challenge. Yeah, and, and, and the problem is for most of the incumbents, denial is a river in Africa. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's um, you, you sort of wait until... Well, so, so in some sense, what's happening right now is, is rather than being a threat to you because of the, the, the limits on capital is, is actually kind of an opportunity because it's, it's making people realize, well, they say, that, that, who was it said, that you change when the pain of change, uh, the pain of not changing is greater than the pain of change, True. right? And, and that's kind of what you're heading towards. So two big things. One, um, car companies need to put big bets yeah. today. Small bets are not going to make it. It's only big bets. The second thing is countries today need to find massive infrastructure projects that pay over a long period of time. The alternative cost of not doing infrastructure projects today is unemployment. Mm -hmm. And we represent, if you want, the biggest infrastructure project on the planet today. At the end of our project, you've connected the electric grid with the road, with the parking grid. And so what about the capacity of the grid? If everybody switches off of oil onto the electric grid, then potentially we're, you know, six to 10% more, burning a lot more coal. Six to 10% more electricity. You can do all that with marginal renewables. So our commitment at Better Place is when I put a car on the road, I put a renewable generation project in parallel that is equal to the amount of electricity we need. And, 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 and we work have access, it through and the you grid. have access to the capital for that? 
Yeah, because look, I, I am allowed to pay, I, I can pay today 10 cents a kilowatt hour for wind coming at any time of the day, and I know how to take it even when, uh, when there's excess on the grid. When we work in Denmark, I take all the excess wind capacity they got at night because I got distributed storage that nobody has. If, if a windmill turns on and off and your TV at home turns on and off, you'd be really annoyed. But a battery on the car, if it goes on, off, on, off all night, but at the end of the day it's charged, you don't know. Nobody yeah. cares. So I've got the ability to take off-peak wind that nobody else can. I have the ability to take... So you said 10 cents earlier, you said 6 cents. 6 cents, is... no, this is 10 cents a kilowatt hour. Okay. Okay, whereas if you looked at the grid and coal, you oh, say, right, well, right, I sorry. want yeah, 5 right, cents yeah, a yeah, kilowatt yeah, hour. Right, right. But, but for me, the difference between 10 cents a kilowatt hour and 5 cents a kilowatt hour is 1 cent or 2 cent a mile. Yeah. Whereas for you, it's a big sticker. I'm on zero carbon or not. Yeah. Okay. And for that zero carbon um, sticker, being a good person, right? Yeah, for, yeah. You, you'd pay a lot. Well, maybe. I mean, Joe Sixpack yeah. probably doesn't care about uh, being zero carbon. Uh, yeah. then, Let me put it this way. We don't need to get 100% of the population on day one. Well, yeah, it'd be pretty challenging. But, but even, even, Joe, even Joe Sixpack, if, if so, there's going to be a, a slow lane for the guys without yeah. the sticker, we'll care about it. Imagine for me a minute, how, how, you know, let's say you succeed in your wildest dreams. How fast does this changeover happen? You know, we're, uh, it depends on, on policy more than anything else. So our model works without any um, subsidy, and it's, it's physically, economically, and um, um, all the business models all point that it works and it's cheaper than what we have today. But the question at the end of the day is how fast it happens is, is a policy. Question. Yeah, so, uh, so, so if, if, is if, that why you're starting in Israel? Yeah, I mean, Israel gave us every policy imaginable that you, I mean, Israel basically came back and said, if you're going to buy a gasoline car, we're going to put 72% tax on your purchase. If you buy a zero emission, no oil car, we're going to put 10% tax on you. Now, if a lot of people will start buying that zero emission car, we're going to raise both levels. And it'll be 20, 80, 30, 90, 50, 100, until we get to 50, 110, we won't stop. Denmark wanted to outdo them, so they put 180% tax and zero. Huh. So they basically say if, if you have electric cars that you can buy at $20,000 and you want to buy a gasoline car, you should pay $60,000 for it. And so, it, those policies accelerate shifts. Yeah. And you might see a place like Israel or Denmark within two, three years not buying a single gasoline car. So uh, what caused them to make that kind of change? And you know, how likely do you think that is in America? Um, I think January 21st changes America. So I think what happens is that Israel recognized that um, it's got no oil, it's got no interest in keeping oil at a high uh, price and it has an interest to demonstrate that you can run a country without oil. So you mean that they actually had strategic objectives? Of course. <laughs> they, they want to yeah, reduce global yeah. warming. Um, yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> the, um, the, the Danes are really on, on the global warming path. I mean, so, yeah, yeah. so Denmark, well, they've also got a lot of wind power. And so they got they wind actually, power and they got, I mean, the grid was ready, everything was, was set. Um, but if you look at, at the U.S., U.S. The has the highest reason why to do it. We, we pay you know, 400, 500 billion uh, um, uh, dollars a year. We're going to go to 700 billion. But the problem is not even that we're paying 700 billion. We have a problem with... with paying, paying 700 billion for what? For, for, uh, for oil. Okay, yeah. Now, we're, it's not even the issue of how much we're paying today. It's the issue of this is a problem that has a lead time of eight years yeah. to resolve. Now, if you're not ready with a solution... Your country will, our country may die in the process of getting to the solution if we wait. Yeah. So if, if so, your if, point was in our oil reserves. We have what? We have 45 days, 30 days to 45 days of oil reserve of driving. Imagine we get no oil supply. What do we do on day 46? No. If if you have one car with electric battery in every household, 120 million electric cars on the road, we have a 12-year oil reserve. The equivalent, yeah. Okay, so, so, so the thought process, this is a strategic initiative for the U.S. It is an economic change of immense proportion because you're taking away this, these hundreds of billions of dollars that go out of the, the economy and you're putting them into jobs in the U.S. So uh, have you had interactions with uh, Detroit to sell on this idea? Um, yes. How's that gone? Um, 
So this is, this is an industry that, at least right now, looks like if it succeeds, it will not be made in America. No, I think what happens with Detroit is, um, is that we've got to a point today where Detroit knows it needs to change. But Detroit has been in sort of self-sufficient mode today. Yeah. And when GM looks at a problem like that, GM needs to come out and say, we, we cannot wait for an in, sort of an industry, a, yeah. an, an infrastructure to show up. Yeah. So we're going to put the power plant in the trunk. Yeah. Right? That's the vault. If you think about it, the vault is yeah. an electric car with a mini power plant in the trunk. Right. Um, I think today GM looks at the problem and says, I can no longer solve everything on my so own. So if you can prove this in Israel, though, you'll get their attention, is your, your thing. Look, you want my dream? My dream, we're at the 100th uh, anniversary of the Ford Model T. Yeah. All right? You look at, at Henry Ford's quote from, from uh, in 1908, 100 years ago. He said, we got to put a car for a family or a single person. Okay. It's a, he gave us the script. It's got to be a sedan, which will, will be easy to operate. So it's got to be a simple thing, not a complex, which our engineers can build with their ingenuity that will allow us to go everywhere we want to go on God's earth. He gave us a script. Mm -hmm. Today's engineers can build this electric car. And he said, it has to be so affordable that every one of our workers can buy it. So the point is, make it cheaper than everybody else's uh -huh. car, and everybody will buy it. So, so time for big bets. Time for big bets. <laughs> so um, moving to a completely different subject, um, you used to be at SAP. Yeah. And I just want to ask you, you know, what your, uh, if you have any comment on the turmoil at the executive levels recently. I'm just in... <laughs> I'm trying to think, what would I say that won't get me into trouble? <laughs> uh, no, you know, it's, instead of looking at the executive table, I, you, yeah. this, or maybe just about then about the I, state of SAP I, as a well. whole. I, I think that you know SAP is going to need to go through a similar similar model shift to a certain degree. And I, uh, you know, I was somewhat advocating that. If if you looked at at um, what happened, is you got to a point where you know there's SAP and Oracle, and there's a line between them, and and you, you know, to, to cause defections of a customer from one side to the next is going to be extremely hard. And we're, we're, the two companies were spending an awful lot of money to, to convince a single customer to move from one side to the other. Instead of that, SAP should focus on two things. One, how do you shift your model away from spending you know, $1 in the beginning with you and then spending 10 to $20 on installing and maintaining the software? Yeah. And, and you know, just come to a point where you can cut the ten dollars of you know maintenance and operations into two, and take a cut of the seven that were released. Yeah. Yeah, SAP is, is building cars instead of being in the oil business. Yeah. So uh, this kind of goes back to, in some ways, the cloud story that we've been exploring a little bit. So uh, you, it, it, so if you, if you'd had the reins, that's what you would have done. Anything else that you would have done there? No, I, I, I would, I mean, the, we've, I, I've, I was a product guy, so we've built a whole list of products that we're basically trying to take into mm -hmm. uh, the existing customer base and give them simplicity in operation, simplicity in, yeah. in, in purchases and in maintenance. And, and the whole goal was reduce the cost of maintenance, get more for an ongoing yeah. revenue stream while, while I help you do yeah. better business and go to cloud and you know, yeah. eliminate the need for hardware, eliminate the need for, uh, for accessibility. What about, I noticed there's an SAP for Utilities conference, um, and, and that kind of raised the question for me of whether there's an opportunity for, uh, you know, or what is the opportunity for big IT firms in the energy business? You know, That's for true. example, Smart Grid, and you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, th there was an idea that I had back at SAP, I can share it now, because maybe SAP will do it now. Yeah, um, most products in the world go through SAP, uh, some SAP system in their production, especially on the production side. Mm -hmm. uh, we know today when we go pick up a product in, off the shelf in the supermarket, we know exactly the caloric content of what we're going to put in our body. Yeah. Imagine we could have the carbon footprint yeah, for Sol this Griffin, item we about that as it went through the entire supply chain and manufacturing, the electricity, the, the uh, packaging, everything, the shipping, everything that happened through. And that's, if SAP could do that, then you could mandate it at, on the shelf. Yeah, is, is SAP working on that at all? I hope. Yeah. If you hear of anybody who's doing it, let me know. They're I'll not telling you. me anymore what they're okay. doing. I don't know why. Hey, uh, if we want to have, <laughs> yeah, to, uh, if, if people want to ask Shai questions from the audience, uh, come up to the mics, and uh, I'll, tr I'll try to recognize you. Um, I wanted to uh, sort of, just go to something we talked about, uh, a couple of things we talked about backstage, back to this idea of uh, the car being a storage device 
for peak power. Uh, that kind of sort of reminds me of one of the fundamental architectural things that we have that we, we, we haven't really been talking enough about. My thinking about the internet operating system, you know, all that led to the name Web 2.0 started actually with peer-to-peer -peer file sharing and the idea that, you know, we actually have this distributed storage, we have distributed computation, uh, we, you know, we don't have to put it all in one place. And in some sense, you know, part of what you're doing with the car is, is treating the car as a storage device for power. Uh, so it's not just transportation, it really is a part of the solution to rethinking right. you know, the electric grid. It, it's, a, it's a systems approach. And so we, we actually consider the battery part of the storage system, if you want, the, the distributed storage system that sits on the grid. And because it's not your battery, I can sort of take a charge cycle off it if the grid says, I really need it urgently. See, the last power plant on any grid, the last one to turn on is the worst you can. Yeah, the most expensive. And yeah. it's, it's like a relief pitcher. Yeah. Even if it doesn't pitch, you need to warm it up. And yeah. so what happens with a lot of these, uh, these power plants, they, they turn on and they, they stay on even if you didn't need it just because there was a sense of you might. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you came in and said, I need 2% of your batteries to, to sort of feed back right now or I need to turn off, shut down all charging of all cars, you sort of get a buffer of about 6 to 10% on your grid mm -hmm. that allows you to manage the, the demand. So, that's, so, so in some sense, if you solve the, the car problem, you also make a pretty interesting contribution the, to the electric the grid car, problem. The car is the biggest solution for climate change. It's not the biggest problem. So today, if you look at uh, cost of abatement of CO2, the cost of abatement for, uh, for a ton of CO2, we're, we're sort of calculating today at about 20 to $30. Yeah. Um, the cost of abatement for a ton of CO2 from an electric car, from a car to electric car, is minus $300. If we convert, we actually make money per ton of CO2 in the global right. economic sense. We'll make money for every ton we save for the environment. The car is the biggest solution. It's 20 to 25 percent of our CO2. And it's the biggest economic savings that we can actually put into, into the system right now. All right. Out here. Uh, uh, Michael Jensen, National Academies. Um, my question really is how to sort of uh, upgrade the operating system of the existing cars. How do we retrofit? And is that something that you've thought through? Because it seems to me that there are awful lot of standardized systems within automobiles that we ought to be able to just, you know, fit a battery in and a power, power pack and off we go. It's, it's the same way we didn't uh, fit um, DVD players into VCRs. Um, manufacturing, even though most of it is the same or is close to the same circuitry, manufacturing has gotten to a point where to take something that's already built, break it apart and build it again is so expensive that you just build from scratch. And the main issue is how do you requalify a product that came back out of your factory to be in good running shape? Because you take the responsibility, the warranty and the, and the ownership of any problem the minute it comes back from, from your shop. Um, We, we have a toxic acid. Just look at it that way. So what we, we've been what hearing we, about that lately. <laughs> yeah, but, but this is truly a toxic acid. It actually poisons us. So, so I want to just finish with, uh, oh, so we have another question here. OK, sorry. Quick question. Here in the United States, is it more <coughs> flex car systems like that, which are time sharing of cars seem to be adapted in urban environments? Are you looking to do something similar to that? So, so if you think of, of you know, I love timeshare. So I've, I've, liked, I, I've seen Zip and, and, and the rest of the guys. The problem with that is um, they don't replace car ownership. They replace taxis. And so what we've seen is in the aggregate of all the 250 million cars we got in America, we've got about 25,000 shared cars. So it's a percent of a percent. Now, the reason is we love part of our contract with our car is we own our car. Okay? I, I hate it when my wife drives my car because I bang my knee when I come back into my car. So you, you have this sense of this is part of who you are and what you want. You know, your stuff is in there. If we start sharing it, it's not a replacement for our car. It's a replacement for our public um, transportation system. And, and the biggest issue, by the way, is not solving it for the urban. We, we all focused on EVs will be this car for the urban driver. 40% of cars in the world are used for urban driving. They account for 10% of gasoline use. What we need to solve is the suburban that drives into this, the, the urban setting and back, or the exurban to suburban, 
drive that doesn't have public transportation, doesn't have any choice, and they always need to go in the middle of, of rush hour both ways. These guys, that's the 25% of cars that account for 66% of oil use and transportation. That's what we need to solve for. They can't share because they come and they go in different hours. So I want to just finish with bringing back something else we talked about backstage, which was really just a story about World War II. You've, um, uh, you know, kind of hinted at the idea that if the market doesn't adopt this, uh, you know, in the way that you hope it will, at some point we're going to be up against the wall. And if we're up against the wall, you know, what do we do? And I thought the World War II story was a little yes, bit relevant there. You know, Pearl Harbor in 1942, we, 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 all know, we all know the story that the president calls Detroit and says to the big three and everybody else that feeds into them, you know, I, I need you to shift away from, uh, from making cars to making, you know, jeeps and planes and boats. And, and the myth is that they all signed up and said, yeah, let's go do it. The, the reality is they, they sort of argued for about a month that it would destroy the U.S. economy, that, you know, the, the workers need to continue to, to produce and consumers need to consume and the economy depends on it. And, and what happened is he really called about a month later and said, I didn't ask you. All right? I told you you're going to need to switch. And we know the immense numbers, the hundreds of thousands of planes and boats, and you know, free, our, they saved our freedom. We, we all owe a huge debt of, of our freedom, the, the entire world, to Michigan. Yeah. But there's one amazing number that most people don't know. Between that decision in 1942 and for the next three years, most people don't know that there were zero cars built in America. Not one car. Now, when it came back, when the war ended, they were retooled for a new, new industry that yeah. immediately was the, the source of the economic growth for the country, but they were retooled already differently. Yeah. yeah. I just think it's a wonderful story because in some ways, you know, we, 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 we have great faith in the market and we, we're trying to spark the market to do the right thing. And there may come a time on some of these, these problems where we just have to go, Holy shit, we just got to do it now. Yeah, you know, looking at the Hummer, I think it's time for the next president to call back and say, stop making tanks, start making cars. Yeah. <laughs> hey, thanks for watching. Thank you.